1862, Victor Hugo published his magnum opus, The Story of Criminal Turned Saint Jean Valjean, with a title that can be roughly translated as The Miserable Ones, The Dispossessed, or even The Victims. Les Miserables was a worldwide commercial success, though initially a critical failure, with critics taking issue with the novel's many digressions, broad characters, and even, gasp, its revolutionary spirit. Sweeping book sales, in the next century and a half, Les Mis would become multiple film adaptations, a TV miniseries, a radio drama, a fighting game, okay, and a musical, which, well, go ahead, Paul. The story of the 1832 June Rebellion in Paris was forever transformed in collective consciousness when Claude Michael Schoenberg and company decided that this tale would make a great musical and became known as one of the single greatest musicals of the late 20th century. Then Tom Hooper decided that this should become a blockbuster movie in 2012, and it became known as the single strangest execution of the 21st century, but, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. And seeing how we're all Les Mis fans, and how it mixes art house techniques, and musical techniques, we figured this would be the ideal combo. So let's see how some of the most celebrated music of all time is represented. Now, prisoner 24601, ah! your time is up and your parole's begun. Who let the kid going through puberty out of the glee club? And I'm Javert. Do not forget my name. That's Russell Crowe playing Javert, a guard-turned-inspector who becomes obsessed with a prisoner named Jean Valjean, played by Hugh Jackman. And what terrible crime did Valjean commit to make him so obsessed? He stole a loaf of bread. He did what?! Inexcusable! In a time of rape and murder, bread stealing will not be tolerated! Critic, critic, calm, calm down, down. Have you ever had French bread? No. Then you wouldn't understand. My sister's child was close to death. We were starving. We'll starve again. And yes, it's almost pointless to talk about Russell Crowe's horrible singing, as he's already been the butt of so many jokes. I'm Yakko. I'm Wacko. And I'm Javert. Shoot! God. <laughs> But what way does Russell Crowe's voice rub people the wrong way? Because in many respects, it's actually not as bad as you may think. Hear me out. When you get down to it, he's in tune. He knows how to phrase his melodies, but he's using a different style. He's trained in rock and folk, a subdued, naturalistic style. Musical theater is grand and stylized, and because of that, the nature of the aesthetic makes it easy to spot a faker. On top of that, Crow likes to use his acting method of if I act like I don't care, maybe I can trick you to care. But in this film, all the other actors seem to have that pesky mind frame of wanting to emote and convey actual emotion. Oh, give me some, I would not dare. We can't pretend all the actors sing great, especially when compared to the stage versions. Say what you must, don't leave it there. But the acting still really pulls through. Like here, while on his parole, Jean Valjean can't find any work because of his past, but a priest, played by Colm Wilkinson, shows comfort to him. There is wine here to revive you. There is bread to make you strong. That's Colm Wilkinson? Yeah. It can't be. Why not? I can understand him. He usually sounds like Sean Connery if his lips were being stretched by a rice picker. The cries in the dark but nobody hears Here where I stand at the turning of the years I mean, shouldn't this be more like There is wine here to revive you There is bread to make you strong You will leave that man alone. He is a musical treasure. I will for now, Kyle, but my collection of Cone Wilkins and funny voices will not go untouched. So Valjean gets arrested for stealing silver from the priest, but the priest makes up a lie for Valjean, allowing him to be freed. This hits pretty close for our hero. So close, you can practically smell his breath. My life he claims for God above. Can such things be? Jesus, guy, take a few steps back. I can see the scenery you've been chewing between your teeth. Yes, and the wide range of scenery is impressive, too. In front of the altar... Back to the hall, back to the altar again, back to the hall. Well, you can't say the pacing in this movie is bad. No, 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 it only works if I do it. Another story must begin. So, 
Now that Valjean wants to break his parole and turn his life around, I'm sure a good chunk of the movie is going to be showing the process of his transformation, from outcast fugitive to an everyday balanced citizen of France. Actually, he's the mayor in the next scene. Wait a minute, what? Yeah, eight years go by and he's mayor. No, 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 no. Nobody just goes from runaway fugitive to being the mayor of an entire town. Yeah, it's usually the other way around. You're missing the point. The transformation could have been a movie all in of itself. And instead, the movie just sneezes it at us. I mean, look at all these people suffering. Dead bodies, children starving. Why doesn't somebody just say, come on, you lazy bastard, be mayor? You like stealing bread out of other people's mouths? That's politics in a nutshell. So Javert, having transformed into Maximus Bonaparte, distracts Valjean's attention when he tries to settle a factory dispute. Deal with this foreman. I might have known the cat had claws. I might have guessed your little secret. That's this results in the factory worker Fontaine, played by Anne Hathaway, being tossed out, while Valjean is congratulated by Javert for not being recognized by him. It seems to me we may have met. Your face is not a face I would forget. Uh, way to bring in that Broadway training there, Hugh. Forget, forget, forget. So Fontaine goes into the cruel, cruel world, selling her hair, her teeth, and ultimately herself so she can support her child. Why? Hasn't she heard? She can be mayor in a jump cut! Hell, by the time this movie is over, she'll probably be the queen of France! Next to Valjean's niece or nephew president! Put a sock in it. Okay. This leads to the big I Dreamed a Dream performance, and... It's, it's fantastic. fantastic. It's all done in one shot, it keeps the intimacy close, and Hathaway's voice and performance knocks it out of the park. The choice of moving the scene to after she becomes a prostitute, and not just after she loses her job, makes the moment all the more heartbreaking as well. It carries shades of Falconetti as Joan of Arc. If the rest of the film were this passionate, we would not be doing this review. So Valjean comes across Fontaine, looking radiant in her Smeagol makeup, and feels guilty because he let his foreman throw her out. Yes, you were there, and turned aside. Yeah, how dare you left a situation you knew nothing about and then asked a guy to do the job he was required to do. Nevertheless, Valjean does feel guilty and takes her to the hospital, where she tells him that she has a child who needs to be taken care of in case she dies. And then she dies. Boy, wasn't that good timing. What's not good timing is that Javert discovers Valjean after he's confessed his true identity. Why did he do that? Well, because another man was confused for him, and so coincidentally being brought to the court on the same day, so the Valjean revealed himself in the courtroom as if Javert wasn't there, so the judge for some reason let him leave to go to the hospital where Javert caught up later. Oh, that old story. But Valjean escapes and vows to look after her daughter, Cosette, who lives with Sasha Vera Cohen and Helena Bottom Carter. Why didn't you use their character names? Because it's Sasha Baron Cohen and Helena Bottom Carter. That's who they always play. Tells a saucy tale, makes a little stir. Customers appreciate the bon vivant. I find it extremely ironic that Cohen is doing an exaggerated French accent in a movie where everyone is French, yet everyone else in the movie has a British accent, despite the fact that Cohen is one of the few British people there. But they shake it up with some of the more offbeat humor, like, oh! God, are they raping Santa? Wouldn't that technically be Father Christmas? I thought it'd be Père Noël. Who cares? They're raping Santa! Well, maybe that was their way of making it a Christmas film. I can just see the ads now. Les Miserables, a musical romp of death, starvation, and raping Santa. Fa la 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 la. So Valjean comes to take Cosette away, who seems to take the whole dead mother thing pretty well. I dare even say it's just glanced over. But to be fair, if you were a girl, you'd probably be happy to suddenly have Wolverine as your father, too. So much so, that it calls for a song that they scotch-taped onto the film just to get a Best Original Song nomination. Never more alone, never more apart, you have won my heart like this sun. You have brought the gift of life and love. So long deny me. Valjean! But Javert spots the fleeing Valjean and chases after him. Not since I shook my head in a room with no lights on have I seen an action scene so well shot. But luckily, he is helped out by a person he saved from a runaway cart earlier. 
You saved my life, Monsieur Bouchelamont. We need a place of sanctuary, this child and I. We need... I need to disappear. We'll give thanks for... <laughs> 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 not too concerned about getting caught, are you? Yeah, Monsieur, we have to keep quiet. <laughs> you may not sing like this! <laughs> so Valjean escapes Javert, Cosette finds a new place to call home, and they live the rest of their days together. And that was Les Miserables, everybody. Man, they had a lot to cram in there, but I think they did the a critic, pretty good no, job. I mean, it, it, it's not over yet, man. This is... That was barely the first third. The first third? They had enough story to fill Christopher Nolan flick. Oh no, there's much, much more. Like Javert swearing an oath to the stars, even though ironically you can barely see the stars. Well, at the very least, this will give more time for the character to bloom. I mean, we can see the connection between a new father and daughter and see how their relationship will evolve. Nope! Next scene, she's a teenager and it's nine years later. Oh, come on! I thought this was supposed to be like the musical of emotion and feelings. It is! Well, how? It's passing over all the essential relationships and transformations that create drama. You can do whole entire musicals based on one of the changes these characters go through, but instead they squeeze each change into one song and then dump in more characters and stories not needed. Why can't they just focus on the already heavy characters and storylines that they have? Well, they do, while also throwing in Marius, Eponine, Gavrol, and Algeras. Four more characters with four more storylines to add to the jumble? Next you'll be telling me they're bringing back characters they already got rid of! <laughs> no. Jesus Christ! As if we don't have enough! But that's all from the original stage show. Which is an adaptation of a book the size of the Bible! Critic does bring up a good point. Doing a film adaptation is tricky enough already, but this is a medium transfer from a medium transfer. You go from a book, which audience is usually allowed to be as long as it wants, to a Broadway show, which audience is usually allowed to be three hours with an intermission, to a movie, which audience is usually allowed two and a half hours at most with no intermission. Exactly. If they want this adaptation to work, they had to make bigger changes without being afraid of the purest fan base. Okay, so we have a gritty, dark, realistic musical that has tons of characters and story to develop. Yes, and they tackle it in the most gritty and realistic way. Marius and Cosette meet up and they instantly fall in love. That's stupid. Yeah, yeah, that is stupid. Not to mention the love triangle that generates between the two of them and Eponine. And let me guess, the one that nobody loves is the one that has the most development. Pretty much. The heart full of love. He was never mine to lose. Paris is in the middle of starting revolution number upteen kajillion because they don't like the way the poor are being treated. This all builds up to the big attack led by the peasants of the town as they set up the barricades all over. Now in the stage version, the barricades are giant, massive sets, truly something to behold. But in this version, they're all squeezed into tiny corners of the town, allowing, of course, to get nothing but countless more close-ups. Because the cinematography in this film is awful. I want to feel emotion for these people, not count how many zits they have. So Eponine disguises herself as a boy, which is pointless seeing how there's clearly women in the barricades in this version, and sacrifices her life to save her not-boyfriend. I'm him. It's all I need to know. We'll make the flowers blow. He, of course, shows his devotion and respect for one that loved him so much by immediately sending a love letter to his real sweetheart. Hey, three's a crowd! But a nice interception by Valjean, who grabs the letter and decides he should go down there to protect Marius, as he might be the only hope his daughter has to living a civil life given the social and financial status of her father. But not before secretly freeing a captured Javert, as he knows the rebels would most likely kill him. And strangely enough, Crow does manage to act in this scene. For a brief moment, it actually sounds like he gives a damn. Once a thief, forever a thief. What you want, you always steal. Yes, Valjean, you want a deal. Shoot me now for all ah, I die. There he is. So yeah. there. There's the autopilot so schmuck I remember. Die. He sucks so much. He has Oscars. Valjean then sings about how important it is to protect Marius, describing him like a son. A son he's only known for a few minutes. Ton, ton, 
my in my prayer. This is especially disrespectful to the original, as the song was supposed to be sung quietly and soothing. Here he belts it out. If I die. I'm surprised he doesn't wake up the entire army. The next day, it looks like our revolutionaries have no chance. You have no chance! In one of the more touching scenes, the young boy Gavros sacrifices his life to fight for what he believes in. This leads to the final battle between the soldiers and the rebels. Oh, I do hope it's all done in close tight shots so that nobody can figure out what's going on. <laughs> Javert looks over the destruction and gives a very tender moment, handing over his medal to the dead boy for his bravery. Now, this really begs the question. The symbol for Les Mis, both the movie and the stage production, is the child Cosette. But shouldn't it be the boy Gavroche? I mean, what does Cosette do? She looks scared and gets married. Gavroche is constantly active, sacrifices his life, and has much more of a character. Why isn't he the symbol of the movie? Valjean manages to escape with an unconscious Marius and come across Javert waiting. But Javert is so confused by Valjean's honor and kind heart that not only does he let him go, but he questions his own morals. Who is this man? What sort of devil is he? To have me caught in a trap and choose to let me go free? God, hearing crow debate ethics is like watching a rock argue with itself. Damned if I live in the death of a thief. Damned if I yield at the end of the chase. I am the law. There is no way to go. Oh! <laughs> really? Really? That, that was the best sound effect I can come up with. Way to kill him off with dignity. Yeah, what other cartoon sounds do you think we could put in there to up the drama? <laughs> hey! I'm oh, sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> so Marius speaks with Valjean on the Titanic and tells him that he wants Marius to marry his daughter, but he can't be around for it because... Reasons that are explained much, much better in the book. It's far Cazette, this must be faced. If he is caught, she is disgraced. So Valjean vanishes, and Marius does end up marrying Cosette, just as he finds out the location of her father, and thus goes to see him on his deathbed. Or... Jer. Now you are here. Again beside me. And is it me, or does a guy who's about to die actually look better than he did at the beginning of the movie? Come with me, the chains oh. will never bind you. Oh, I am ready for it. So Valjean finally passes, the spirit of Fontaine is there to greet him, and all the souls who perished are joined again next to the sculpture that even Napoleon called a giant eyesore. Final thoughts on the movie? Well, I think it's great. It did a wonderful job to update the musical as well as adapt it in a way that moviegoers would enjoy. It has its problems here and there, but I think it's fantastic just to see it in movie form. Well, I thought it was terrible. It's clumsy, it's awkward, it's full of moment upon moment that doesn't work, and it commits the biggest crime any adaptation could. It made me question whether or not the material it's adapting was that damn great to begin with. You? Well, uh, as someone who enjoyed the musical, but acknowledges that it had problems, I think the film is kind of similar. Some moments hit it right out of the park, and others don't even make it up to bat. So, on the whole, I'm glad I saw it, but I don't think it's great. 